Welcome everyone to Asia Society at the Sundance Film Festival. This is our fourth year and we have an incredible array of films to present to you this year. The one that you're about to hear from the filmmakers on is called Midwives and it takes place in a very remote part of Myanmar and the filmmaker herself is from Myanmar and we get an incredible glimpse into a, a female facility uh, with with raw footage and I, I think it's a must see for all of you. Let's show a clip from Midwives, please. I'm, I'm glad you were able to show that clip because it is definitely one of the more intense moments of the movie. Let's bring on, please, the director and producer of Midwives, Snow Hanin Hulain. Hello, Snow. Hello, Janet. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. We would also like to bring on the producer, Mila Ong Thuyen, who himself also is half Burmese. Am I able to say that or do I yes. know Myanmar is the correct term? <laughs> And thirdly, last but not least, we have the COO of Asia Society, Deborah Eisenman. She herself has been studying the region of Myanmar for many years and has some interesting perspectives to offer up. Hello, Deborah. Hi, Janet. Nice to be here. Thanks. Yes. Well, we're very, very fortunate to have all three of you on this uh, particular panel because Myanmar is truly one of the more uh, difficult to understand regions of the world. We know that many people have struggled to, to know it better. Um, we're aware of the, the woman Aung San Suu Kyi, who has been in many ways uh, the poster child for, for Myanmar, as, at least in terms of the Western community. Um, Snow, please tell us what it is that motivated you to make this film. In 2012, in the Rohingya conflict was happened uh, in Rakhine State. So like uh, many, uh, a million of Rohingya flee to Bangladesh and, and there are 60,000 Rohingya still living, living uh, with a Buddhist community. So that's new coming to, coming to me and it was really hard to believe like all these like um, hatreds and, and like, uh, you know, fighting each other between two, two community. For me, it was hard to believe because I was born in Rakhine State. When I was little, uh, these two community were friends and, and peaceful state. And then suddenly it all happened. And for me, I really wanted to understand what is really going on um, in my hometown. So that's the reason I went back to uh, Rakhine State and trying to find out this story. Mm -hmm. And you chose a particularly intense, very, very uh, specific environment to, to shoot this movie. I mean, uh, a, a place where women are giving birth in any region, anywhere, anytime would be already pretty remarkable. I think in this case, you, you portrayed a place that brought in Buddhists and Muslims and where they were, the patients were cared for by Buddhists and Muslims. What, what did you find there when you were there? Is it... Uh, what, what did you learn from spending the five years that you did covering this, this clinic? Yes, um, when I start talking about, you know, uh, making film in a conflict region, for me as a uh, women filmmaker, I wanted to make a documentary about uh, other women because it, it would be more easier for me to understand from other women perspective views about this conflict. So like in the region, like uh, I hear from some of my relatives, they were saying that Rohingya population is growing day by day because of like, there is no, you know, uh, 
there is no uh, bad control, bad control. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's why a lot of population coming out. So, so that I had an idea that, okay, what are the midwife rules in the conflict rating? And, and like, uh, and I had a script in my mind that I'm, I want to find uh, two midwives, one Buddhist and one Muslim walking together in the same village. So I don't know any of the, any, any of two characters before I made this film, I just have these two characters in my mind and then I contact my relative living in that region and through from my relative, I, I found these two mm. extraordinary two midwives in the region. Because the, the, um, um, I chose that uh, region because that region was no civil war that time when I started this documentary because also landscape is really beautiful. And I wanted to find out how um, coexistent like two women together from different backgrounds. That was my main idea. Mm. Well, you definitely captured some incredible, very, very unique footage, getting so close to everything that's going with, on within this small clinic. It's extremely admirable and you clearly developed a lot of uh, trust from these women. Um, Mila, how is it, Mila Ong Fin, how, how is it that you got involved in this project? Well, my uh, father's side of the family is from Myanmar, so I returned there a couple times. And in around 2015, I actually went to the same village where the film is shot, um, Niau, where the, um, all the big temples are, and I took my kids. And uh, I, it always stayed with me that I wanted to return one day and make a film there. It was just such an interesting place. And then the violence broke out, and it was like, it's even more urgent. And I returned to Myanmar to teach uh, documentary filmmaking and I was paired with Snow. And then she showed me the footage that she'd been shooting. And I was like, wow, this is just fantastic. And then I just wanted to be a part of her project in any way I could. So we just sat together and looked at footage and during our spare time not teaching, we would be editing, editing footage together. And that's how the uh, relationship started. Was there some footage that in particular that you chose not to show or how did you align on what was what was worth keeping in the movie? <laughs> well, we've, we've had a really interesting editing process, partially because of the, the troubles in, in Myanmar and also because of COVID. But um, we, we tried ed remote editing together and Snow basically laid out her vision. She put a five hour assembly of the film together and we have one other editor on the project and we would just go through footage and then send it back to her. And it, I don't, I don't think it's really sat right with snow to be editing, not face to face anymore because we couldn't travel to each other's countries. So at one point she kind of demanded, we like, we have to sit together in the same room. So the only place that she was allowed to travel to, and I was allowed to travel to was Bangkok, Thailand. So first we went there and edited under COVID lockdown for a couple months and then later, we, she was able to go to Germany. So now she's in Germany, and I flew to Germany for a couple of months. So we had, we've been having this international ongoing debate of what goes in and what uh, comes out of the film. But really, I just took her lead on what she had shot. Uh, like in terms of sensitivity and like not including certain things, it, that wasn't the issue. We were really, I think Snow wanted to show the nuance between the relationship of the women. And the longer that she filmed for, the more that the metaphor of like what was going on in the country sort of paralleled the conflict in the women's lives. And so the more she filmed, the more sort of layers the film got. So it was, it was almost easy in a way to identify the more interesting scenes, as long as we stay true to the characters. And like these women love each other, but kind of hate each other and are forced to get along and are even in their own way or making like in their own sort of conflict way are making their village so much better and stronger. So I think that's what we really sort of focused on. Well, that's what came through loud and clear because it was very noble for this woman to open up this clinic and invite all to come. But you see how external circumstances inevitably are going to affect their dynamics. And it's a very stressful situation for anyone who's been through childbirth. <laughs> um, it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's almost like a crisis, you know, the, the timing of everything and what's going to happen. And it's not just about births, there's other diseases and, and, and help that, that women need. But it's, you know, it's a high, uh, high intensity <laughs> environment. And to have that in a high intensity, uh, larger environment of what's happening in the country, I think was, 
was kind of it was a very very uh, brilliant and 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 poignant uh, way to capture I think what what is going on. Um, Deborah, as someone who has traveled extensively to Myanmar, what did you make of this? And and had you seen anything uh, like this before? What you know, uh, I imagine this is not the typical footage that that you see coming out of Myanmar. Exactly, Jenna. I mean, this was really a, a beautiful and compelling film, and I think um, really showed um, some of the dichotomy in Myanmar and some of the fragility in Myanmar. I'd like to talk about some of that fragility, um, if I may. Um, you know, Myanmar has been under nearly 50 years of military rule since its independence. Um, and its independence was only in the 1940s. And during that time frame, we've seen kind of numerous economic uh, Sorry. Um, so 50 years of military rule and then 13 years of kind of democratic transition starting in 2008. And in that time frame, there have been numerous political and economic developments and growth. But during this whole time, so 70 years, basically, you've had an, uh, a civil war raging throughout Myanmar between the military and a number of ethnic groups. One ethnic group that isn't counted in this kind of uh, inter-ethnic warfare is the Rohingya, which is a Muslim population living mostly in Rakhine state that was seen as um, um, undocumented immigrants from ba Bangladesh mostly. Um, and so there've been long waves of conflict against the Rohingya, but really um, reached a peak in 2017 when 700,000 Rohingya were driven out of Rakhine at the hands of mostly the military. So really compounding all of what I've laid out now is the military coup that happened a year ago, um, overthrowing the democratic government on the charges of election fraud. So in this past year, the economy has sunk. The healthcare sector is completely nearing break and the military has killed 1500 people and jailed thousands and then COVID is raging through the country. So to me, seeing the film in the context of the complexity of Myanmar, um, the, the history of conflict of Myanmar, the inter-ethnic conflict of Myanmar, this film is really almost a triumph of these stories, you know, of the, this, the fragile story of, of the Rohingya Muslim, of the fragile story of, of um, inter-ethnic relations, inter-religious relations in Myanmar. And, and showing that complexity, I think, in a, in a really um, beautiful and compelling way. But I think taking that historical context in mind is, is really important. And I'm so glad this film was out there to show. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, again, so difficult to get those really intimate those, and very raw moments regardless. And it's, it's so many of the reactions are, are so unfiltered. Did you ever feel Snow Amula in the course of making this film that it was almost too much or that you might not be able to continue or or it was going to be dangerous or, you know, these women are, are so brave and in some cases conflicted and and uh, it's, you know, it's it, it really kind of tears at your heartstrings. What was it like to work with them over that long period of time? Oh, for me, like when I started something, like when I started anything, I would be finished to the end. I will never quit. I'm not a quitting person because, because I really wanted to uh, tell this story through from my film language. Also, like I wanted to talk about, you know, my country with this kind of story. That's what I always wanted. So, of course, there are a lot of like... Uh, um, conflict and civil wars going on and a lot of, you know, fear when I was shooting in a kind state. Um, I never think about quitting. I, I want to finish it. And then I wanted to bring it to, to the war because I wanted to know, I wanted to prove that I'm a, uh, you know, I'm a filmmaker and I can make this kind of documentary film from, from Myanmar, not from, um, you know, there are a lot of documentary came up from Myanmar uh, made by uh, foreign filmmakers. So I wanted to show the film made by Myanmar filmmaker. You're a true warrior. Did the women themselves sometimes resist being filmed or did they just say, well, we're, we're in the middle of doing this, so come in. They seem to be so welcome. Your camera got so, so close to them, right, mm -hmm. right in their faces. Was there ever any resistance? Yes, um, they kind of like La and Niu Niu, uh, they have, um, they are also very strong, supported women. Um, 
of course, there are the moment that I had to leave from the village um, quickly because of the suddenly civil war happened, like during our shooting. Mm -hmm. So that moment that we, I, I listened to my characters and all the people living in the region. Uh, but, but I know that I will, I can come back to, uh, to the village for continuing um, my story. And I, I always have her, um, you know, communicate with uh, two of my car writer. They were always calling me, you know, sometimes I'm not, I'm not in Rakhine State, but they become like my family. They become like my sister. So everything going through in a Rakhine State, even I'm, I'm sitting in Yango, very safe, but I feel, I, I feel for them. I'm because they tell me everything. So I'm, you know, it's like, Physically, I'm, I was not there, but mentally, I'm with my car writer. What about you, Mila? Was there anything particular that stands out about the, the making of this film that distinguishes it, either an obstacle or something very, very... Well, I mean, at first, I, I wasn't there for that, but at first, the only resistance to snow filming besides, like, you know, the bosses and the police checkpoints and stuff, the characters, it took a little while before they understood what the difference was between a journalist and, you know, a long form documentary filmmaker, like nobody in the world really knows the process of how do you make a documentary who in their right mind would come back every few months for five years and just keep filming me in the middle of nowhere. Like people don't understand that concept. So snow has to sort of teach her characters what it is to make a film, which is essentially collaborative. Like, they're writing the story of their own lives in their dialogue. We're not adding narration. So after a while, they start realizing, oh, we're making this film with Snow. And she's, she's not just going to show up one day and put us on the news and make us look bad. It's, it's, it's like an effort that we're doing together and we have input. So I think that's always interesting to know. And I mean, even now, they probably don't really, they haven't seen the final film. So they had to trust her a lot that they would make something that's quite you know, representative. And then like you saw the footage is footage of Hla's mother in the film. And that was like something that Hla wanted to see her mother, you know, that wasn't even really shot with the intention of putting in the film. It was something that Hla just, you know, she's so happy that it was filmed. Mm -hmm. So that's like, to me, a very interesting. And then I found that in editing and it's like, hey, what about this footage? So it's, it's something like I, 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 when I would look through the footage, I just was found these moments of like real kinship, you know, between snow and, and the women. And so it was like, I think that warmth comes out. That's why there's no filter you know, mm -hmm. when you, when you're watching the cameras, there's no, there's no coldness. The only difficulty we, we had was, I mean, logistically, I guess, snow, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong. Like every trip to the village was hard. But in the last year, we didn't have an ending to the film. And because of COVID and because of the coup, Snow was really unsure if she'd be able to return to get the final scenes of the movie, of which they're very, very important, you know, when they're all reflecting on everything. So it took, that probably took about a year of waiting before you're able to go back, Snow, right? And, and film yes. the final scenes. And then so Nyonyo's little girl had grown up. So we see her born in the movie. And by the end, she's like, a big girl you know so it's quite that addition of time didn't completely hurt the film but we were worried for a while there like will we be able to go back yeah yeah that that was true because um, I wanted to uh, add about uh, why I cannot go back to Rakhine State for final shoot because of the uh, mili uh, sorry uh, COVID because of the COVID I cannot travel to other states but um, actually in in the Rakhine State the, um, um, sorry, COVID was not a big issue because there was civil war happening in Rakhine State. That was a big issue. Um, that's the reason I don't want to put any layer about uh, COVID because COVID is was very small for them. Like uh, because for them it's like this civil war happening in the village is they have been living in a danger situation. So yeah, I cannot go back. But when military coup happened in uh, in Myanmar in February and um, um, civil war between Rakhine army and Myanmar military, they stopped for shooting. They stopped like, uh, they stopped it for that moment. So, so when I hear from my car writer, I immediately take a flight and I went back to Rakhine state because that was the, that, that trip was like, I was not, I feel so safe. 
after long, like uh, after three years, I being so much worried about all my safety, like uh, so much worry. But the last trip, the final trip was super safe. Like I feel so, so peaceful in a, in a Rakhine state in a way, but actually not really peaceful. But somehow compared from other region in Yango and other state, you know, Kaya state and, and Karan state and compared from other region, Rakhine state become peaceful state. So. Mm -hmm. So it was like, uh, it, it was uh, such a great time to go back. Uh, yeah, I feel, I feel so safe. So that uh, I can finish a final shoot uh, and like, uh, because in, in Rakhine State. But anyway, when I was, when I left from, from Yango Airport, it was so scary because no one, no one was on the, on the road because of the military coup, everyone, no, no one is traveling, but somehow like I hear, I hear that like Rakhine, flight to Rakhine State is, is running. So I immediately take that flight and I went back. Well, as a documentarian, both of you are so experienced, you know to expect the unexpected and you can't predict always what's gonna happen. But it sounds like a couple of things. One is that you did encounter the danger, but you found a place that was safe. And it also sounds like something you may have experienced in past projects where there's a perhaps a level of empowerment and mm -hmm. uh, it will be interesting to see what happens when these women see themselves on screen and how that might change them and, and whether that will help redouble their, their efforts and their commitment to having this clinic, which again, in and of itself is like a, an oasis in that part of the world. Um, do, you, do you know if, if they have any uh, plans to see it? Is there any way that they'll be able to see it privately perhaps? Well, we have to be careful. And I mean, for now, we don't, I think we don't want to risk any screenings within the country. We're being kind of cautious. Um, I think we're both optimists, though. Snow and I are both optimists, thinking that maybe the government situation will change this, that it's kind of untenable, but maybe we're too optimistic. <laughs> we do have to eventually show in the film, I think, maybe the worst case scenario would be one day Snow can travel back there and then, you know, physically show them a copy to, just to them first. Mm -hmm. um, but in a way, like the, the, the way it started out, right, Snow, correct me if I'm wrong here, is that uh, Snow promised at the beginning, we won't show this film in Myanmar. She told that to her characters because the, the, there, there was such a level of intolerance towards Muslims that even the idea of the film, people didn't want to even support the idea. That intolerance in the public now has changed. And I think a lot of it has to do with realizing is like the government wasn't telling the truth. So mm -hmm. um, maybe one day, but it's really, I, I, I would say right now it's, uh, we're trying to get the word out to the world. Mm. Well, I think the world is ready to embrace a movie like this that shows such heroic, heroism on the part of these women, such strength and 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 commitment and vigor and you know, it's it's um, quite remarkable and that includes you Snow <laughs> to have uh, really traveled this journey uh, at, at all costs and I, I do hope people very much see the film and have at least a glimpse of a better understanding into this troubled uh, area. Is there anything that uh, we meaning the audience can do to in any way help the situation in Myanmar? I mean, long-term snow, I think we've been thinking about this recently. We're trying to be cautious with our characters, but at some point soon before the film goes into wider release, I think we'll set up some kind of uh, funding campaign where we can provide them with medical equipment for their clinics. Because mm -hmm. as snow has reported back, they're just always in a lack of everything. So uh, we do want, uh, maybe you could follow, uh, snow on instagram or us on twitter and then there's a midwives film uh instagram account and we'll follow we'll we'll follow up in the next few months with ways you can contribute or donate or something like that i think that would be the best whenever they can give get medical equipment donated or cash to buy it mm. i think that would be very strong mm. okay that, that sounds like a really good plan and and you think you can get this equipment or funds to them yeah, it's a little bit difficult to arrange like right now, but uh, we, we will. We will. We will prevail as you did in making this film. 
Thank you both so much. And thank you, Deborah, for joining us. Uh, please, everyone, go see Midwives. You will not be disappointed. It's a, it's a very, very rare glimpse into the workings of, of what it's like to, to uh, be servicing women, and especially women in, in such a trying area. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.